my name's Lauren Kratz and I'm the Librarian 3 for the Octavia Lab. I'm joined today with Aldrich Linton, Librarian from the Science Department of the Los Angeles Public Library. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Your Author series featuring author Johnny Christmas. Today, Johnny will be discussing his work, Swim Team. Please feel free to use the chat box to send in your questions and comments, and they'll be answered towards the end of the program. Also, don't forget to email ECDEPT at LAPL.org for your chance to be entered into an opportunity drawing to win a copy of Swim Team. We want to thank our generous donors, the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Greenberg Fund, as well as the Library Foundation and our amazing behind the scenes staff for helping the library bring these authors and illustrator programs to you virtually. Thank you all so very much. We would like also like to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land. We recognize and acknowledge their elders, past and present, as well as their descendants. For more information on which territory you may reside on, check out native-land.com. CA. In today's Your Author program, we will be joined by New York Times best-selling graphic novelist Johnny Christmas as he discusses his latest book, Swim Team. And now for what we have all been waiting for, welcome Johnny. Hey everybody. Hey Lauren. Hey Al. <laughs> Hi Johnny. Johnny. Welcome. Okay, so thank you for joining us. Thanks, we really um, appreciate you taking the time to answer some of our questions today and giving us the opportunity to learn about your creative process. Um, so I thoroughly enjoyed reading and dissecting this book and hope more people get a chance to read it. Um, so as James Lipton would say, let's begin at the beginning. Johnny, do you have a favorite part of Swim Team that you'd like to share? with the audience before we begin the questions? Hmm, favorite part of Swim Team. Um, I, well, I'll say this. Uh, there's a part of Swim Team that uh, generally when I when I create a story, it, it can happen in many different ways. But in Swim Team, it sort of started in the middle and radiated out. So there's a, there's a sequence in which Brie is completely under the, underwater when she's learning how to tread water. And she's like in this ocean of, of like, it, it just feels like this infinite water on, on all sides before she starts getting more comfortable, like, oh, actually, I know how to do this. Um, that was kind of where it started for me, along with my own personal experience. That was the image where I was like, OK, I, this is this is a book. I can build it. Now, what does it look like? You know, how do I build it out? Um, so that that would be my favorite part, because it's the part that kind of encapsulates the entire book for me in, in uh, the most fullest sense. That's great. Can you tell us some of your favorite haunts in Florida, since the story takes place in Florida, as well as the pivotal experiences you had in your adolescence? Just like Brie. <laughs> oh, my favorite haunts in Florida. Uh, I was a kid who really liked the library. I loved hanging out at the library. It was this, um, I grew up with four other siblings and uh, the library was this giant space with a lot of, which was very quiet and lots of books. And I love the uh, the sense of discovery that you could just kind of wander through, and you could kind of you could you could just pick your own adventure, um, and and it was so completely diverse in terms of what you could find there. Um, and yeah, that was, that was kind of like my favorite place: the library, bookstores, and also just kind of walking around with friends, just um, just seeing the neighborhood, how the neighborhood would change day to day, hour to hour, season to season, and, and having conversations. Just kind of like moving and talking was was kind of uh, was kind of yeah, pivotal experiences. Um, I, I would say, I guess school. You know, was always the the big one. That's that's the the, the pressure cooker or the uh, or however you want to put it. Um, but my, my school experiences were always pretty good. I got I got along with everyone pretty well. Um, so it was just kind of like kind of learning how humans behave <laughs> <laughs> that I didn't grow up with. I knew how my family behaved and my my siblings and parents. But school was very interesting, um, especially growing up in Miami, Florida, where. Um, we have this incredibly diverse uh, population. I, I grew up with, um, you know, Caribbean parents uh, in a black neighborhood, but the schools I went to had um, majority like Hispanic kids, but then also like 
like uh, black American kids, white American kids. It was just this big jumble. And everybody was from somewhere else. I had a totally different experience, whether it be from Honduras or from Georgia. They were from like all over the place. And it was it was it was so completely interesting to 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 hear how everybody how everybody's uh, inflections were, their slang, their, their mm -hmm. food, their um, their values. And the thing that was really interesting were, was just how much the same we were. We're all kind of like the same kids, just with different stuff on top of it, like a different um, expression of the same basic um, wants and needs, I guess. Mm. You, you mentioned walking and talking as sort of like this thing that you remember from your childhood. Is that something that you still use? Like when you're, if you're stuck in a creative rut, do you go out and walk, walk, around, walk around for a bit to sort of get... Yeah. You can, okay. Uh, it, it's a it's a main it's a main source of um, <clears throat> it's a main source of writing that's not sitting. Um, like if I'm mm. sitting out during, during my writing hours, I'll, I'll you know I'm I'm writing then. But most of the um, truly deep um, leaps in terms of writing happen when I'm walking. Mm -hmm. So I'll have a writing session and then I'll immediately go for a walk and try not to think about writing. And it'll all start coming into place. Like the, the puzzle that I'm not trying to solve on the front of mind is being solved in the back of the mind. And then sometimes when I'm consciously trying to write, so like sometimes I'll I'll walk for like a half an hour to just, you know, loosely. And then I'll kick into like, okay, like problem solving mode, but without pushing it, just like presenting the questions and walk. And by the time I get back, I always have something. Always have something when I'm walking. Always. Wow. That's incredible. Thank you. Um, I read that the inspiration for this graphic novel came from an incident where you fell into a pool as a, as a kid and almost drowned. Um, how has your relationship to pools or large bodies of water changed or has it? It's a very good question. Um, has it is, is truly the, um, um, the real question. I think I, um, in my conscious mind, it's changed because I've taken swim classes and I've, and, uh, and I, and I'm not a little kid anymore. So I feel a lot more comfortable around it. Um, but I do feel that sense of panic who levels down, you know? And I know that at, I know it's there. So if if I was completely disoriented and fell off of a thing and into the water and like it was nighttime or something, I wonder how quickly that would rise. Um, so so I I I'm gonna give that one a yes and no if I'm, if I'm <laughs> so comfortable with them. Um, yeah, I, I think about that quite a bit because it's um, because uh, panic is something that once it starts, it's uh, it's a, it's a very it's a it's a it's a it's not something that's easily controllable, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, so uh, I, I try to keep my practice up so that I don't so that um, I'm trained to not um, panic should that mm -hmm. ever arise. I don't know if that answers the question. In a, it seems like a very zigzag sort of thing, but, um, but it's, I guess it's a zigzag kind of feeling, I suppose. I think it did answer it. I think it's sort of complicated, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Right. And, it, and it tends to sort of shift depending on the situation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Johnny, there's a rich sense of history in this book, and a concept that stuck with me was, if you can't swim, it's not your fault. Was the act of writing and illustrating swim team a process of self-healing? And or was it an invitation to help black and underserved communities heal? Both. Yeah. It was um because as a kid, I, I did think it was a personal failing. I thought it was like my mm -hmm. fault that I didn't know how to swim. And I didn't, and it, it was only later that I realized, oh right, I was five. I didn't build the pool. I didn't actually, I didn't have control of whether I got to swimming pools or not, and I whether I had access to pools. And um, and if a pool was available in my neighborhood, you know, there wasn't one. I didn't I didn't have a, a say in that. Um, and then as I started doing research for swim team, I started realizing just how few um pools are in black and brown um, neighborhoods and the history behind as to why that's the case and how they were systematically pulled out or under-resourced uh, to the point where they're um, not as usable as they can be. Um, so I, I, if there's anything I can that, that I hope this book um, does is that it, it raises that question and it um, you know prompts communities to, to say, hey, why don't we have a pool? We're paying these taxes. You know what? Like there's pools in other neighborhoods. Why don't we have pools or pools that are that are resourced to the point where we could actually use them or enough pools um, that uh, our, our young people don't encounter a pool 
many years into life, you know, because once you're if you're if you're eight years old, the first time you meet a pool or a large body of water, water that can be quite catastrophic if you don't have, uh, um, you know, if it's not a safe environment or if, if things are just kind of unwieldy and things go awry. Um, but if kids have access to to swimming very early on, it becomes just a, a mechanical thing that they, they work through, like how um, like I often think of it in terms of walking. Uh, those of us who, who can walk um, have had access to it so early on that we don't even remember when it happened. It was just something that we, we, we have access to it all the time. So we do it, we do it, we do it, and it's to become second nature. So if you have access to swimming, I, I know many of my friends who learned to swim very young, they don't quite remember when they learned how to swim because it was something that mm. they just had so much access to it that it was just like, oh, right, yeah, swimming, that's just a thing that we do. I remember the first time I encountered a pool. <laughs> I remember it very well. And that's the reason why I wrote this book, you know, I almost drowned. And um, that's uh, that's something that I, that I hope we can, we can slowly change as a society. You know? Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, we, uh, I won't get into my story. Um, in Swim Team, um, the protagonist, Bree, is invaded by insecurities, um, self-doubt, and fears that appear in large grayscale bubbles. Um, the format is striking, and I found myself interpreting her negative feelings as a separate character. Um, what inspired you to use this narrative format, and how much of her fears are or were your own? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, what, what inspired me was I, I was thinking about how to populate um, her her um, uh, negative thoughts and feelings and, and um, intrusive thoughts in a way that felt unavoidable as they do feel when a person's encountering them. Um, and luckily, with this wonderful format of graphic novels, you can you can kind of you can create the world in a way that um, yeah. you could blur the lines between fantasy and reality. So in that way, I could create these storm clouds that actually suck up all the room in the panel, depending on how intrusive this thought is. And um, I, I think the first time it occurred to me was a swimming pool. I, I thought about when she jumped in the pool and she had to out, out swim her fears. And I had this vision of like, oh, she jumps in and it's like completely inundated with all this negative thoughts and she has to swim through it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the outside, if it was these crazy storm clouds that are just all around because um, the way you perceive the world is no different than the world, really, to each person, right? The, where you turn your attention is actually your, where you turn your attention or, or how what you're attuned to is actually your life, how you live your life. It doesn't matter if you're um, living in a mansion, but miserable, you'll be miserable. Miserable will be the, the, the shape and form of your life. Um, so I wanted to, to, to illustrate that in a way that, that um, really got that across that um, no matter what the uh, circumstances of one's life, the way um, we feel about them could be quite different and, and could push things in, in a certain way. So um, I, most of most of the fears that she has that I that I share were, were like the little kid ones where like she's like afraid of losing her keys and stuff. I was petrified of that as a kid. I, <laughs> I never lost my keys, but I always thought like, I don't know if I was just going to be, I've had, I'd have to ride the rails from then on and just like, you know, tr travel the, the, the train system. Because <laughs> I can't go home because I lost my keys. I don't know what it was. I, I, um, th that was a huge one. A lot of little ones like that. Um, uh, but but luckily, I, I'm not plagued with um, with like too many uh, intrusive thoughts or whatnot. I do ruminate from time to time if, if I if I let it go, um, but, but not not as bad as, as when I was younger. Thanks, Johnny. Now, your career as an artist started at an early age, and I'm sure that over time you've developed some great habits. Can you enlighten us by sharing some of your favorite methods and tools you used when writing and illustrating Swim Team? Yes. Um, so tools for when illustrating Swim Team. I, uh, I used to draw um, traditionally on paper. Uh, comic books traditionally we draw an 11 by 17 Bristol board, which is a, um, a, a thick white board that that can take water without buckling too much. Buckling is a sensation when you fill a piece of water with too much uh, piece of paper with too much water, and it does that that kind of it dries in a kind of buckly way, a kind of wavy way. It'll dry and it'll stay flat. Um, so I would draw in pencil on that. Then I would take a, a bottle of ink and a watercolor brush, and I would 
draw again the pencil in a fixed form, what we call inking, you know, or, or a final drawing. And then I would erase off the pencil shaving, scan those in, and then um, send them off. With the uh, swim team, I wanted to try a digital method, a 100% digital method. So I had a, I used the iPad Pro and this program called Clip Studio Paint that's really good for comic book making. And for the first time, I did the entire process digitally. However, with the colors on Swim Team were done by this wonderful colorist, Hillary Jenkins, and she uses a traditional method of watercolor and, and, and acrylic. So I was doing these digital lines and I'd send them off to Hillary and she would have this traditional method that that most people don't use in comics anymore. Mm -hmm. So you'd have digital lines on top of this very old school traditional method, and um, which works wonderfully because you know she she gets all the, the, the cast light off the pool. Like if you'll notice in Swim Team, there's like little blue, there's like always reflected light because she's a painter. She knows like kind of mm -hmm. light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I thought that was such a wonderful uh, push and pull of the two. Uh, methods. So I would say for, for anyone who wants to create, um, start with whatever method you enjoy. I think I do enjoy paper, like a traditional method best, but uh, digital is still pretty fun. Like it, I like it just slightly more. Um, but whatever it is that you enjoy, that'll keep you doing it. That's the main thing mm. that you keep doing it. Uh, if you keep, it doesn't have to be like anyone else's. Actually, it'd be best if it wasn't like anyone else's because then, it, then you have something truly unique. Um, but the more you do it, the better you'll get. It's just a, just the nature of, of, of all things, you know, um, the more you do it, the better you get at it. So it's always best to focus one's attention on, on positive things because you'll get better at positive things rather than things that may not be so um, beneficial um, to yourself and society at large. So, um, so, uh, so keep, keep making your comics, um, keep writing them, uh, start from life if you can, cause that's, cause then you, you're, you're, um, absolutely the master of that domain. So you know exactly what you're talking about. So nobody will say like, oh, that's not what it's like in France. Like, right, if right. you know what your home life is, <laughs> you are the expert, you know? Yeah. And you can dive as deep, deeper than anyone possibly can because you're the only one who knows that, that world. That's great advice. <laughs> yeah, and I can tell that the, I was wondering about that because there's like this yellow, the yellow here, I thought I had stained that. But it makes sense now that it was digital and then, you know, the yeah, artists use watercolors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Johnny, do you um, do you have a favorite pen or pencil or drawing pad? Like something that you, you uh, have, have? You know, not in terms of pencils. I would use um, these lead holders. The, the, is what they call them, basically just lead inside of a piece of plastic without uh, wood, so you don't have to uh, um, shave off the wood. You just shave off the the lead to sharpen it. But what I, with the tool that I really loved the best um, back in my analog days was the Windsor Newton Series Seven watercolor brush. It's this brush, this uh, it was usually like a number one or a number two I'd use, and it's they they would uh, take the hair off of a Kalinsky sable in Russia somewhere. I don't know what's going on with these things. They were very expensive and they plucked the, the, the hair out of the tail out of these weasels and they'd uh, ship them over to us and, and charge us exorbitant rates for them. Um, but they were they would they would hold a point really well and they would hold water really well. So you can you can um you could do these beautiful lines that would hold um hold a lot of liquid without having to redip your your mm. panel. It's a beautiful line. Uh, but then uh, at one point we had a, a shortage of weasels in Russia and I couldn't get those <laughs> as much, which kind of encouraged me <laughs> going to, um, to a digital method. So I haven't used, wow, I think it's been a couple of years since I've used my beloved uh, Windsor Newton Series wow. 7 watercolor brush, but um, I, I hope to be reunited one day with <laughs> the, the weasel hair. <laughs> so Tony, you are a very prolific writer um, and illustrator. Um, with an endless list of past, current, and future projects. Um, so in other words, you know what you're doing. When the inspiration came for Swim Team, and you actually touched upon this already, um, you said that you started in the middle and sort of worked your way out. Um, so, but the original question was, did you start, did you know what the story was going to be and you work chronologically to the conclusion, or did you start at the end of the story knowing what the conclusion would be and sort of worked your way to the beginning? That's a very good, very good question. Um, generally, how I work, and I think this was the same with Swim Team. Swim Team was unique because I had a, I, I knew I had a middle 
tent pole that I knew I wanted to, to, to go towards. But I generally have a beginning, middle, and end, and I, I make it very short. Um, uh, like I'll, I'll know where it's ending and I'll know kind of where it's beginning. Um, but then I'll write just kind of like a, an outline of what it is. And by the time I get to the end, I always find that I came up with a, a new idea of like, oh, that'd be really better if or if that middle part was would be stronger if it started at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I kind of move that and then I write it again. And every time I do it, it, it takes uh, its shape a little bit better. Um, the stronger stuff becomes stronger and I put it in places that are um, optimal for, for storytelling and the weaker stuff I, I throw out. And I, I kind of do that over and over again, a lot of times longhand, so that I have time to to think and not be distracted with the computer. I, I, I leave the computer until like the last possible moment. Um, I try to write out everything in longhand as much as possible. And I'll just I kind of like mm -hmm. rewrite and rewrite and rewrite this thing longhand, almost like this, um, um, you know, there are these whirling dervishes that would um, would would dance you know, around and around in circles or whatever. And they would just kind of, um, and, and I heard the poet Rumi would sometimes just kind of spin and spin and spin until the, the poems would come out of them or whatever. And I think that mm -hmm. the, this writing was just like this practice of just sort of getting it out of me, getting it out of me and just uh, keep spinning and spinning until it just keeps coming out and stronger and stronger and stronger until I know I have something. And then once I have something that I'm like, oh, okay, I think this is something I, I could I can work with this. And then I feel confident. Mm -hmm to then start making the stronger parts stronger and the weaker parts gone completely and tightening up the dialogue and, and thinking about how the art should look and, and what kind of um, form it'll take. But that process of longhand writing and, and letting it be what it'll be is just completely enjoyable because at that point, there's no pressure. It's mm -hmm. just the, um, the act of spinning and, and just like being in this, this um, this moving meditation of, of just kind of letting words and pictures and images and and just truly enjoying the art form for what it is instead of having to think about where it needs to go at that point it's just mine at that point um, so I, I um, so that's kind of how it that's kind of how it starts for me and then at that point then I put it into a script form you know I use almost like a movie script type format and then mm. now work that dialogue, blah, blah, blah. I make it as tight as I can on paper before I even think about drawing it. Because if it's working on paper or on screen or however you do it, it's going to work a lot better once you start putting pictures behind it. Mm -hmm. So if your comic book is working real good on the page, like on with words, oh. you know that it, you, you probably have something once you start adding images, because then it's just like it starts singing, right? Mm -hmm. And then once you start adding images, there's I just start cutting words because it's just all redundant. It's just like, oh, well, there it's, it's, I can see it now. I don't need that. I don't that I don't need that. Um, so like probably like two percent of what I write actually makes it into is actually read by the reader, if that much, you know. Um, so much of it is just kind of um, getting it out and, and clarifying and making sure that I I really have something that I, I can see. And then once the, once the images go down, then it's just easy. The drawing part's like the funnest part, the most enjoyable mm -hmm. part. But then it um, is. Every step of the way, it just becomes more and more of itself. It becomes a comic book, you know, a graphic novel. Uh, you know, there's this this thing, and and it's 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 a it's a it's a good process. It's 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 enjoyable. It's long, but it's enjoyable. Thank you. Yeah, it almost sounds like you were preparing to make a film, like the sort of like process of writing a script and adding like the, the video afterwards, or in this case, like the illustrations afterwards. Yeah, yeah, very much so, because because it takes a while to draw these things, so. Um, you don't want to lose kind of the the essence of what you want to put in mm -hmm. um, by thinking, oh, I'll remember it. Like, you're probably not going to remember it. Like, you remember mm -hmm. this but the little subtle things get lost. And sometimes those subtleties are what make a book, you know, just like mm -hmm. little true things a character will say to another character mm -hmm. that isn't big enough for you to remember, but it's just it's just the perfect thing that another human would say to that human in that moment. You know, mm -hmm. um, most, of the, most of the moments in our lives that really resonate aren't these beautiful speeches that you hear in movies. It's, it's that 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 time when your grandmother looks over at you and she's like, "Oh, you did you did good today." You know, that can hit like, you know, and and sometimes you just want to get that stuff down. Um, it's true. You want to get the truth down. Johnny, mm -hmm. I feel like that you do that throughout Swim Team, the little things, Bree's relationship with her dad, with Miss Etta. There are little things that when you reread Swim Team, you pick up on the little things, those special relationships we, she had with them. 
Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. One thing I I was, was, oh, sorry, oh, I'm so sorry, Al. Al. You go ahead, Al. <laughs> One thing I was, we didn't ha have a question, but um, I didn't notice that uh, her father is a single parent until like a few pages in. I think I was maybe 10, 15 pages in before I, I noticed like, whoa, it's, like, it's not what I'm used to. But I mean, it's not what we're not what we're used to. You know, so they probably have sort of like the general narrative, but th that was a really great addition. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 if that happened so early on in the the writing of it, I don't quite remember why I did it that way. But I, I knew it was, I, it was important for me to to show that that not only was he a good dad, yeah. um, within a family like they they weren't a family unit; they were a family unit of two. But but he was a good dad in that. Um, that setting and he's going to do his best for for his daughter so that when when times in the in the story as the story goes along where she starts feeling a lack of that presence the the reader would feel it too because they're just like this guy shows up. that's what he does you know so what's going on here you know so i wanted them to feel it like she felt it and um so 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 i think that might have been a part of it but but it, it happened it happened pretty early on and it just felt right for, for the dynamics of the story and their relationship and, mm -hmm. and yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think Brie realized throughout the story that her dad was working hard mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. He was doing those night classes for them. And I and I, I like how Brie shows her maturity where she does she does realize that. She just wants him to come once. Yeah. They want to <laughs> swim me just once. But she you can as you're reading you can tell that Brie is mature enough to figure that out. Yeah, like when, when I was a kid, my, my parents were uh, both uh, immigrants from the Caribbean and they, they worked all the time and they didn't do a lot of extracurricular stuff. And I remember that was just kind of the understanding that me and my siblings had around it. We didn't um, we didn't feel like they, they were working, you know, and they would come home and they were tired and we could yeah. tell, you know. So we, we didn't want to add to their troubles, you know, by... Uh, um, maybe a little more so i remember at to to the point where i remember at some point my parents were like kind of hey you should tell us that you're doing this thing like we're we'll come and i was just like i don't want to bother you you know like that kind of thing like so uh so i think that that kind of informed a lot of my um thoughts on brie um mm -hmm. and, and her kind of um maturity around that until there was this one very very important thing that she just really wanted to share with them you know mm -hmm. which was their swimming no spoilers, but the dad does good even at the end. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> Jan now, Janet, I know throughout our conversation, you've been sharing definitely wonderful writing tips. But one of my favorite questions to ask authors and illustrators is what advice for youth that want to become authors and illustrators would you give to them? I would say draw from life is uh, the first thing uh i used to draw like super exaggerated comic book you know mu muscle folks all the time and i had a, a teacher who wasn't the biggest fan of comics but uh he knew we weren't going to stop doing it so he was like if you must draw these things then go to life drawing and university of miami was of you know like maybe a 20 minute half an hour walk away from my high school and they had life drawing classes that i think were like two dollars uh, something like that and I think there were Tuesdays and Thursdays, I believe. And you could go pay two dollars, even if you weren't a student. You're just I was a high school kid, and you could you could draw from life. And my drawing like took off like like a shot when I started. Instead of drawing um, from other drawings or from my imaginations of what things were, if once you're actually focused on an object and seeing how a person moves in the world, how a chair looks, um, how um, how things actually appear instead of how you think they appear, your drawing starts taking off immediately. And then another thing that when you're drawing from from life is that you, um, if you have two eyes, eyes are cameras basically. So um, you you got two cameras in your head and you're learning depth of field and how to your brain is learning how to choose which line to make because you can only make one, but your eye is actually ca capturing two things. If you draw from drawing, that camera's already decided it for you. 
But if you're doing it from life, you're actually learning how to decide how to make those best choices, how to create your own, not create a style. A style is basically just a just evidence of where you were, basically. Um, yeah. But your style will start to emerge. It's the way your choices, your you. Your choices will start to appear on the page. So draw as much as you can, draw from life, and um, and actually observe what you're observing. The, I, I remember the, my first form of meditation was drawing. I didn't know what it was. I wouldn't have called it meditation at the time, but I remember like dropping into the moment in a way that was very um, uh, that was very new to me because you know I was just a distracted kid. I was over there, you know, everywhere, future past, you know, all over the place. But I remember it was the first time I was actually like in the present moment. Like I was actually there, and I was like, "Oh, this is weird." Like time is like, I don't know. I can't describe it. It was it was really beautiful. And when you're drawing, you can do that. You can actually be in that room with that chair, with that. Um, if you're drawing your brother, you know, or if you're drawing uh, an orange or whatever it is, you're actually there in the moment with it, and you can actually. Um, observe it as it is instead of what you think a face looks like you know when you draw the smiley face and the line and whatever that's not what a face looks like you know you have to like sit there and make a decision on where light shade form um all of that stuff and it takes it takes quite a bit of time mm -hmm. but it's worth it it's it's not um the time that it takes to get good is not a burden it's a it's a joy mm -hmm. so get on the road and 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 enjoy it. I feel like especially when you're learning how to draw, like you still are learning sort of the principles of it. Um, I think artists tend to keep sketchbooks around um, that they fill and fill. They have multiple sketchbooks. Is that, is that true with you, Johnny? Do you still keep a sketchbook? Do you fill it with as much as you can? Do you take it with <laughs> you after traveling? You know what? Um, I, I just I just got a new sketchbook because I, that was my new, my. I, I was trying to get back to this. I'm still trying to get back to sketchbooks, sketching, sketchbooking. Um, being a professional artist has has taken away a lot of the time I have for um, just enjoyable drawing, just draw, drawing for the joy of it. Because so much of it, it takes quite a bit of time, especially when once you're done writing. I like have a set writing hours and I have set drawing hours. Then after that, then it's like, yeah, you know, then there's life. But I, I am trying to get back to um, I, I've, I've gone back to life drawing to kind of force it into my schedule, at least that way. And um, and I and, I, and I'm, I'm hoping that it'll spill into just enjoyable sketchbooking. But no, that that's been that's um, those days have, have, have left me for now. But I, I hope to revisit them someday. Mm -hmm. What is something um, you know now that you wish you knew when you first started? become an author and illustrator? That's a very good question. Um, you know, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, I, this is going to sound weird, but I was pretty self-assured in terms of when I started, because um, when I started on the, on the, the path of, of like, a professional, you know, author person. It was I was thirty five, you know, when when it came out. So like I was pretty confident of the path that I was on and how I was doing it. And, and I and I could see that some people were doing things in ways that I wouldn't choose to do things. So if anything, it was just more um, fortitude and staying with the path. And, and what I what I thought would be the best way, because at that point you you kind of know yourself, so you think. So I I knew myself to the point where I was like, how how do I maximize what I've got here instead of trying to do what? Because someone else is mac probably maximize their choices are probably maximizing what they've got, or maybe not, or whatever it is. I I, I have no control of that, but I, I can control where I focus my attention. The, the um, the willpower I put behind things and the plan I put in place, um, not how the plan unfolds, but I can I, how I shape it or or or, or, or lay it out. So, um, geez, I, I don't I don't know. I, I, I would I would just be kind of I would just I would just say like stick stick with the plan. You know, is what I would have told myself, and I'm glad I did. Um, uh, but for others, if if I had to give that advice to to someone who who wasn't if all right, I'll give that advice to myself at 20. How about that? All right. <laughs> Woo, here we go. 
I, w- I would say um, if I was 20 now and I was in the, and that was it, I would say uh, stay off social media as much as you can. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, stay off, uh, get into a place of deep um, creation as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff vying for our attention right now um, mm-hmm. because for, for because because there's lots of stuff vying for our attention right now. Um, but the work that you create when you're not in a thousand places, when you're actually in one place is really good work. If you don't believe me, um, all of you out there, young writers, take this afternoon, turn off your phone and write something, anything, right? Write, uh, write your grocery list. I don't care. Write something. And then tomorrow do it while your phone's on and while you're like, mm-hmm. whatever, and, and read both those, those things and you'll see. Um, now magnify and uh, multiply that across weeks, months, years. Um, and you'll notice that your, your stuff just gets better and better and better and better the deeper and deeper and deeper you go. Um, because you're, you're really getting all this stuff out. You're, you're spending more time with yourself. You're learning how to be comfortable with the silence, with the boredom. Some people call it boredom. I, I never get bored alone, you know, like, so just, just go there and, um, and, and, People will tell you that that's not the way to go, that you need to be plugged in every second of of every moment of every day. And that is not the way to do it. Um, You make very shallow stuff that's not of lasting quality. And um, and it'll be fun for now, but nobody wants to read it tomorrow. Uh, That that sounds very moralistic, but that's the advice I would give, you know. Thank you. Do you find that you, that the title author, uh, title of illustrator, that you resonate deeply with that title, or, you, or I, yeah, I'm curious about that. Uh, you, we could, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good one. That's good I, I would say I, I do like author because it's very broad. Um, yes. Because uh, before folks would say like comic book artist, you know, and it's, but that wouldn't encapsulate the writer or, mm-hmm. or illustrator mm-hmm. or writer, and it wouldn't really. All of them kind of have a little domain. Cartoonist is a good one. Mm. List is fine, but author is is good because then it, um, you know, if, if one day I've got a book of poetry in me, you know, I could just right. I, don't, <laughs> I don't have to scratch out the the, the plaque on the desk and put another other. This is this is a really good question because I've thought about that. I was like, cause the first time someone called me an author, I was like. I like that. Um, It sounds great. It does, right? (laughs) It's like that. It sounds like a like a photo on the back of that book jacket where you're like, you know, all like, no, it's it's an author's photo, right? (laughs) Comic book, bar guy photo. (laughs) Oh my goodness! Okay. Johnny, do you have any current authors or illustrators that you find inspiring? And do you have any recommendations of any authors or illustrators that you enjoy that we should check out? Ooh, um, uh, let's start with authors, because uh, there's this book I'm reading right now um, that's that's been well talked about and for good reason. It's called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. It's a beautiful mm-hmm. novel um really really wonderfully written i'm reading uh <laughs> here's a here's an oldie but goodie i'm reading uh discourses by epictetus right now nice bit of stoicism it'll it'll change your life in, in the best possible way um in terms of uh you know actually this is this is an interesting one i just read this book called uh, agnes murderous by um uh graphic novelist who lives here in British Columbia, uh, Sarah Libet. And she also wrote a book called Tangles, which was about her um, her journey with her mother through Alzheimer's. Um, mm-hmm. She has a like, really powerful um, way of telling a graphic uh, graphic story, um, like very deep, very nuanced. And she doesn't get an, enough credit, I think. It's just really quality work. Um, and um and, and that, that that's that's my recommendation right now. I, I'd give it to Sarah Leave it. Um Agnes Murderous. It's a very impressionistic form of drawing. So it's um deceptively simple, like it like 
you'll look at it and you go, oh, these are whatever. But it, it it's akin to a pre- like a, it's almost like impressionism or something. It's very mm. um, it gives you room to to fill in the space in terms of, of drawing. Seems like you draw your inspiration from a lot of sources, um, and so I'm really curious to. Do you, did you have a music playlist when you were writing Swim Team? <laughs> uh, that's, that's a very uh, my my music playlist <laughs> over the last couple of years has been it's been Al has been ratchet. I'm telling you, <laughs> Al is up and hold some music. Al, I've been listening to the I've been listening to a bunch of Future and. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah, like rock music over the like right now it's kind of going into a dip, but over the last uh, I would say over, like from like 2014 to 18, it went it was through sonically very exciting. Um, so I was just like I was just in it, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes you have to plug your ear holes because man, <laughs> just, <laughs> they're saying it's kind of rough, but man, it was it was, it was good music. Um, but uh. Yeah, I would say that my 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 music tastes are quite eclectic. They're they're all over the place. But that was the stuff that I was I was really diving into. Um, I just love the the beautiful simplicity, mm-hmm. but also like the um the wonderful surprises of, of the sonics and and also the um you know even even sometimes when when some of my favorite rap guys will say like crazy stuff, they do have a, um a musicality that I think is under um, underappreciated. Mm-hmm. Like just, Future swings. Like if you if you listen, like in the 1920s and 30s, they would say, "Oh, he swings." Like his musicality, mm-hmm. his timing is very like. Um, it, it's there, there's something there, you know. There, mm-hmm. There's something there. It kept, kept me back. Kept, kept me coming back. Yeah. But don't listen to that, kids. Please. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't please don't listen to that. <laughs> um, they're, they're already listening. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, how how can your fans contact you? Do you have social media? Can you share your social media accounts with us? Website? Uh, yes, uh, I'm on Instagram. <clears throat> excuse me, at Johnny Xmas. Uh, I'm on. Uh, I have a TikTok. Uh, I think Johnny Xmas as well. Uh, John uh, J underscore Xmas is my um, Twitter, um, and. Uh, yeah, and I'm on Facebook, Johnny Christmas. Uh, I, I'll, I try to respond to, to everyone, but I, I I try not to spend as much time on social media, so I'm not very timely with responses, but I probably will respond. Like, um, So you, you can find me there, for sure. Yeah, and you also have a really great website. Um, I do, yes, johnnychristmas.com. Uh, uh, you can find more information on the book and me and, and all that stuff there as well. Thank you. And Johnny, can you tell us all right, what you're working on now, if you're allowed, and is there going to be another swim team? Um, I'm working on a. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, everyone. Uh, I'm working on a, a book right now um, about video games and summer camp, and um, and uh, I've been chipping away at it for a while, and uh, I'm looking forward to to diving into it mm-hmm. again this winter and really like just bringing it home. Um, uh, as for future swim teams, I I had not cons- hadn't planned on doing more. <laughs> and as for now, I the plan is not to do any more. Um, but people have, have asked the question, and every time they ask the question, I I ask the question, <laughs> and then and and and, and um in the day that I start wondering what Miss Ed is doing is the right. day that I might be on the road to writing another one. Like, oh, what is she doing today? Like, oh, is she like. <laughs> Are oranges in season right now? Like, what is she doing? <laughs> you know, like um, that that might happen, but but for right now, the plan is 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 no. To, to, you to know, I just had to ask. <laughs> Maybe Miss Etta and all her friends. I love at the near the end where Miss Etta, her swim team, they're adults and they all come back together as friends. I that's another great great part. <laughs> yeah, I love that part too. It like really warms my heart. I'm like, oh. Like, I'm cheering and I'm writing it. I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> so before we enter our rapid fire questions, a couple things. First, please don't forget everyone. If you want to enter for a free copy of Johnny Christmas Swim Team, please email 
E C D E P T at LAPL.org for your chance to get a free copy of Johnny Christmas's swim team. Also, I just had to give you out a shout out, Johnny. Children's librarian Andy mentioned in the chat, congratulations on the National Book Award nomination. And I see on the website your swim team is on the long list for National Book Awards Young People's Literature. So congratulations, Johnny. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Oh, and Andy, I heard about it from my um, my editor. I was uh, my editor, Andrew Arnold. I was uh, writing in the morning. I got a text from him and he and uh and it was like, oh, did you did you hear or did you see this? And I was like, oh, and I, and I clicked the link and I was like, what? <laughs> huh? How? So, um, but so I'm so grateful and it's, it's, it's incredible. So thank you. You definitely deserve it. So thank you, Johnny. Congratulations. Okay, just we'll give just give everyone a second. If you have any questions for Johnny and the swim and about swim team, you can put it in the chat. Al, do you have, I know you have maybe another question in there, possibly well, while we I do have, well, perhaps I can ask a question. Um, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> you, you mentioned earlier that um, you had sort of gone away from using like analog, pen, pencil, stuff like that, and more digital. Are you mostly using your iPad now, or do you have one of those huge tablets to, mm. to work with, your, especially with some of the illustrations and stuff? iPad. Um, wow. During, yeah, during the um, I have my trusty iPad Pro right here. Um, during the uh, pandemic, I moved to this tiny, beautiful little um, island we call them the Gulf Islands out here in DC. And um, yeah, this this is a guy that. I, uh, wow. Um, and um, I didn't want to take my entire. I had a giant Cintiq, you know, the big thing, and I didn't want to take that whole setup. And I thought like let me see if I can do my process as small as possible. Mm -hmm. And, um, and if that's the case, then, then maybe I can work in future from lots of other places. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, so I had my laptop that I'm speaking to you on right now. I had my iPad pro and I had this, um, remarkable tablet, um, that I started writing longhand on. Um, so that way I'd have all my notes. And we just like writing, 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 writing. And so so those three things basically were my workstation. Um, and of course, I had like flashcards. Sometimes I'll write down little like scenes and, and kind of um, so I can mix and match scenes around and stuff. But for the most part, that's, that's that was kind of my, um, my my process. Yeah. Do you find that that portability is important to you, being able to just pick all of your equipment you need to make <coughs> anything? And, and move? Uh, in the current moment, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I can see um, in uh, in time that maybe I, I'd want like kind of a more fixed situation because I did enjoy having a giant desk that I had yeah. in the old studio that was impossible to move. And there's something about that um, um, being anchored into something yeah. like a mountain felt really good. Like, mm -hmm. a, like here I stand, you know, I'm gonna, <laughs> Um, but being light on my feet and, and uh, portable feels really good right now. Maybe it's just the nature of, um, of where we've been in the past couple of years, you know, mm, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but it feels, it feels right right now. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. We're near the end, but are you ready for some rapid fire questions? Ready. <laughs> I'll go for it. Math or swimming? <laughs> swimming. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Dachshunds or mastiffs? Mastiffs. Oh, beach or deserts? Beach. Okay. Music or quiet when working? Quiet. <laughs> Day or night? Day. <laughs> Oh, at night. Let's go at night. Okay. <laughs> vacation or staycation? I like a staycation. Me yeah, too. <laughs> Summer or winter? Summer. Wow. Okay. Singing or dancing? <laughs> uh, singing. <laughs> Great. Thank you. You did, you did wonderful. <laughs> 
and Johnny, I just have one quick question. Do you do puzzles like Miss Etta at home? <laughs> I, I have I have a couple of friends that I puzzle with periodically. They're like, they're the puzzlers. And then I just like kind of parachute in like, hey, what are you guys doing? You know? <laughs> um, but but I, I don't on my own, no. Are you the type of person where there's only two or three puzzle pieces left and then someone's working on it and you come over and, and just put those three in because it's happened to me? Oh, that is, that is cold. <laughs> <laughs> I would be tempted to. Um, but I would try, I would try my hardest to not do that. I don't know if I'd succeed, but I would try. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Johnny. It was such a pleasure to have you today so at the Your Author. And please, everyone, check out Swim Team, such an amazing graphic novel by author Johnny Christmas. <laughs> Thank you both. I really appreciate this. This was wonderful. So much fun. Yes. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this conversation with author Johnny Christmas. Remember to visit lapl.org slash events to see more of our amazing programs. And our next Your Author is set for September 23rd at 4 p.m. when the Los Angeles Public Library will be joined by author and illustrator Tyler Fetter as she discusses her young adult graphic novel memoir, Dancing at the Pity Party, about the premature death of her super cool mom. This acclaimed graphic memoir has been called cathartic and uplifting as the author works through the process of grieving as well as being able to move forward. As always, those attending this virtual program will have an opportunity to win a free book. Also, please participate in the Library's Bio Blitz Challenge, which runs until September 30th. Um, go to lepl.org slash theme slash bio blitz um, and you'll, for more information, you can see that at the bottom of the screen. Um, please put on your calendar September 23rd to the 24th for the Lo Los Angeles Libros Festival. And you can go to lapl.org slash libros dash fest for more information. Um, until next time, we truly appreciate all your support. Um, the, the success of all of our library programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you.